Let us gather together with sincere hearts, ready to serve fervently and serve joyfully as we worship the God who gives us life and purpose. And this is In The Moment. I'm your host, Reverend Ricky Allen Jr., thanking you as always for joining us on this lovely day the Lord has made. And wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I just pray that the Lord Jesus Christ is leading out in front of you and all around you by the gift of the Holy Spirit as we enter into the Burr months. That's right, people. Uh, it's all uphill, but downhill all at the same time. Uh, shout out to all my September babies out there. September is my month as well, the 14th. And I am very excited, very blessed, and I'm praying to make it to that next level, folks. Ready to make it to that next level, but we got to take it one day at a time. Amen. And I pray that you're excited as I am because it's the fall season, and the fall season means the leaves are changing, the kids are back in school, though I only have one in college now, the other is graduated. I'm praying that you'll get there as well to uh, take in <laughs> this season that I am in as well. Uh, I pray for the young ones that are back in school. I pray for the older ones that are in college. And I pray for those who may have just gone off to the military. So whatever season you are in, this is a fantastic season of transformation. If you're praying for transformation, don't worry about it. Transformation is coming, it's happening, and you're in it to win it. So trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Amen. So let's get started. Our morning scripture comes from Philippians 2, 1 through 4. Philippians 2, 1 through 4 reads as follows. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish, selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value of others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Isn't that something we need right now in this country? People looking at the interests of others. It will make us a whole lot more united people. And you know what I'm talking about when I say that. Um, and right now, can we pray for this country? Is that okay? I mean, we got another debate coming up uh, here this month. And I know many of you are worried about that. And you know you're worried about the country and all that. But it begins with prayer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Are you aware of that, though? And that's what we should be doing every time we get worried about this country. Because God sees it. God is sovereign. And I have hope. Okay? Just remember those two things, and you'll be all right. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you with grateful hearts for the blessings you bestowed upon our nation. We pray and thank you for the freedoms we enjoy and the opportunities we have to serve you, as well as our fellow believers, our fellow citizens out here. Lord, we pray for our country's leaders at every level. We ask you to grant them the wisdom, the integrity, and the compassion to make the decisions that affect our lives. Help them to seek your guidance and to govern with justice and mercy that comes from you and not from this world. We lift up to you the divisions and challenges our nation faces, the lawlessness, the, uh, the boldness of evil coming out in society as we speak. We pray for everybody down in Georgia affected by the shootings. We pray for the whole process of that. Lord, help us be more proactive and not so reactive. It seems like we're always in a position of reacting, but never in the position of proactivity. And that's where we need to be at, Lord. We just actually give us the tools to do it. Help us seek your guidance. Help us heal the rifts between us. Help us see the humanity in one another, the Lord in one another, to listen with the open hearts and to work together for the common good. And may that common good lead us from the common work of this world to the special redemptive work of Jesus Christ. We ask for your protection over the land. Shield us from the harm, be it natural disasters, violence, or any form of evil. Comfort those who are suffering and bring hope to the discouraged, Lord. We pray that our nation will be a beacon of hope and freedom in the world and not a place of disarray and confusion. 
Let us use our resources and influence to uplift the oppressed and to spread your love to all corners of this earth. Most of all, Lord, we pray for a spiritual awakening in this country, not just a revival and everybody to be on fire, but true repentance so that they may come to know you and be baptized. May we turn our hearts back to you, recognizing our need for your grace and your guidance. May your love flow through us, transforming our communities and our nation from the inside out. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So Romans 12, 9 through 13 reads as follows. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reading of your already blessed word. We ask you now, Lord, to, as always, do what needs to be done, say what needs to be said. Help us learn from your word always, not just read the words, but help us learn from the word, Father. These and all things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Christianity has a heartbeat. The, 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 it's pumping the spirit of the Lord throughout the entire body of Christ. But what does that look like, though? So the Lord led me to Romans 12 today, and I want to share with you a few thoughts from these verses that I believe helps us bring into perspective what the Lord Jesus Christ showed Paul that he's showing us. So let us get started here. First of all, in verse 9, there is the pulse of authentic love. The pulse of authentic love. We see that in verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. At the core of Christian living lies love. The steady, life-giving pulse that drives all other aspects of faith. Paul emphasizes that this love must be sincere, not a mere superficial gesture, but a genuine force that shapes our actions and relationships. Like a strong heartbeat, this love should be consistent, never wavering. This love isn't passive or undiscerning. Let me say that one more time. This love is not passive or undiscerning. This is why the love of the world has limitations. Why? Because it is passive. It, it pretty much, whatever's going on, fine. Well, I'm, I'm going to love you through it. It's undiscerning. It doesn't let the person know what they're doing is destructive in their life, that is wrong in their life, because there is a line between right and wrong. But when it's undiscerning, Every, it, there's nothing to be said. We, you can't say, you can't say anything. You cannot respond in a way that is offending people. And some folks out here right now, we're going to tell the truth, need to be offended because they need to wake up and understand the lives they're living is wrong. And and they act like they're doing okay when they're not because they're so busy trying to be right when they're wrong. And someone needs to say, hey, what are you doing? This love isn't passive or undiscerning. It requires us to make clear distinctions, clinging to what is good while rejecting evil. Such discernment maintains the health of our spiritual hearts. This love extends beyond mere affection, calling for deep devotion to fellow believers and a selfless honoring of others above ourselves. In other words, love should be the constant driving force behind all of our interactions, pumping spiritual vitality through the body of Christ. And then there is the beat of devoted affection. Verse 10, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Paul deepens the call to love by emphasizing the importance of brotherly affection among believers. This kind of love goes beyond the surface level. It's so deep, so warm and personal. The term brotherly affection suggests a tender 
heartfelt connection that should exist within the body of Christ, reflecting the closeness and the care that siblings share, or they're at least supposed to, okay? I get it. Some of y'all got siblings out there right now that you're looking at and laughing about in your mind right now that you're not close to, all right? But in, 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 the, in the kingdom, your siblings will be that person you can go to with those thoughts, with that need. You should be a team. If you're not a team, I'm praying for you, all right? But that, that is what it's reflecting here in the scriptures. This love creates a community where people truly feel valued and supported, fostering the unity and strength. Uh, a little bit more, Paul challenges us to outdo one another in showing honor. This call is not just about competition, but it's about creating a culture of mutual respect and encouragement. It's about being intentional and recognizing and celebrating the worth of others, lifting them up with our words and actions by prioritizing honor and respect we contribute to the health of our community as believers, where every person feels seen and valued, enhancing the heartbeat of Christian living. And then there's the rhythm of fervor. Verse 11, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Building on that foundation of love, Paul addresses the energy and enthusiasm that should characterize our faith. A healthy heart maintains not just a steady beat, but a vigorous rhythm. Similarly, our spiritual lives should pulsate with zeal and fervor. This isn't about fleeting emotional highs, but a consistent, passionate dedication to serving the Lord. Many of you right now, your faith is put in a container of pre-workout. You can't get your heart going until you take that pre-workout. You can't get uh, your life on track until you have that cup of coffee. And it goes on for maybe one or two hours, your heart is racing, you, and you're alert, and you're doing stuff and things, and then guess what? You come down that caffeine crash, don't you? We all do it, including yours truly. I love a cup of coffee. But I also know that a cup of coffee has time on it. <laughs> I know that eventually I'm going to need another cup of coffee. All right? Somebody's laughing out there because you know what I'm talking about. This be, you know, confess, tell the truth, shame the devil. You know, it is what it is. You know, we all, we well, the majority of us do it. I know some folks that don't drink coffee. But um, there is something out there that gets your heart pumping. And then you've got to revisit whatever that something is to get it pumping again. But here we see that you're lacking spiritual fervor. Do you have spiritual fervor today? Can your heart be going even when it doesn't when it doesn't have those things that, that get it racing? Can is your heart racing with the spirit of the Lord? Is your heart racing with the with the desire to help others? Is your heart racing to know the Lord more, to get closer to Jesus Christ, to get into your word and to be able to apply it effectively and correctly and in context? for others to understand and know that the God is you serve. The image of spiritual fervor invokes a heart fully engaged in his vital function. Paul urges believers to resist spiritual lethargy, maintaining instead of an, an inner, instead maintaining an energetic commitment to faith. Fervor is an aimless excitement, but it's channeled into service to the Lord. And it reminds us that the Christian life is meant to be lived with a vibrant rhythm of purpose that reflects our deep commitment to Jesus Christ and his mission. And then we see the endurance of faith. A good heart that's pumping well can maintain. You can run for miles. That's why folks train. They train their cardiovascular system to run that race, to run those marathons. But it takes work. What's the work here? Verse 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. In, in this, this verse, Paul outlines three important aspects of a resilient faith. Joy and hope. It speaks to the forward-looking nature of our faith. 
anchoring us in the promises of God, even when the circumstances are challenging. This joy isn't dependent on the current situation, but on the assured future we have in Christ. And for the record, if you think that the Lord does not know what you're going through right now, I'm here to tell you that God is watching. He hear, He's heard it. He's seen it. And he's going to respond. Patience in affliction reflects the enduring quality of faith. Like a heart that continues to beat even under stress, our faith is called to persist through the trials. This patient isn't passive resignation, but active perseverance, trusting in God's presence and purposes, even in the worst of times. And then there's faithfulness in prayer. It, it underscores the vital connection between the believer and God. Just as the heart needs a constant flow of blood to function, our spiritual lives require the ongoing communion with God through prayer. This faithfulness in prayer is both the source of our strength and the expression of our dependence of, of and in God. And then there is the outflow of compassion. Verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Here Paul moves from internal attitudes to external actions, showing how a healthy spiritual heart naturally leads to compassionate deeds. Sharing with those in need is a practical expression of the love and fervor discussed earlier. It, it demonstrates that our faith isn't self-contained, but flows outward to meet the tangible needs of others. In other words, it is nourishing and keeping the body alive with the blood of the Lamb, with the Spirit of the Lord, and can operate the correct way. Practicing this hospitality goes beyond just the mere sharing of resources, though. It involves opening our lives and homes to others, doing life, creating space of welcome and acceptance. This hospitality reflects the generous heart of God and builds community amongst the people of Jesus. Both sharing and hospitality are ways our faith pumps life and love into the body of Christ and the world around us. Let's dive deeper with that, shall we? Let's, let's dive deeper. The systole and the diastole is in spiritual vitality. Okay? Let's look at verses 12 and 13 a little bit more. What does it say? Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Viewing these verses, and then we're going to be done, through the lens of a cardiac function, it is going to help you and provide you a powerful thought process or metaphor for understanding the rhythm of Christian living. In the heart, systole is the contraction phase where the blood is pumped out to the body, while the diastole is the relaxation phase where the heart chambers fill with blood. This cycle is crucial for sustaining life. Here it is. In, my, in our spiritual lives, yours and mine, we see a similar pattern. The systole of our faith represents active, outward-focusing aspects. Being joyful in hope, faithful in prayer, sharing with those in need, and practicing hospitality. These are moments where we're actively engaging our faith, pumping the spiritual vitality into our lives and the lives of others. The distole is reflected in being patient in affliction and in the receptivity required to recognize the needs of others. These are times of inward focus, building resilience and allowing ourselves to be filled with the grace of God through Christ Jesus. This spiritual distole prepares us for the next phase of active service. The, this rhythm of receiving and giving of internal growth and external action creates a sustainable cycle of spiritual health. And when there is spiritual health in the 
body of Christ, that means there is spiritual productivity because the limbs of the body are able to operate. The mind can think clearly. The tongue can speak the word of God. The feet can move in the way that God needs us to move. The body is working together and not doing anything that's going to compromise anyone. And that, my friend, is the blessing we have in knowing this Lord that we know. We are here not because we're trying to get things. We are here because he's already given us things. We are here not because we're trying to do things to receive things. We are here because we are responding as believers to what has already been done for us on the cross with Jesus Christ in his resurrection. The greatest thing God could have ever done is send his son Jesus to be born of a virgin, to live amongst us as the word, to die on the cross, and then rise again with all power in his hand. We have this hope in Jesus Christ. We have this love of God's word that makes us want to live in the way that we need to live, that we should be living. The problem with many believers out there right now, I might be see, here listening to some right now, might be talking to a few right now, you might be watching me, really don't care. The problem with many believers out here right now is you got a bad heart. It's skipping beats. It's not consistent. You're not spiritually healthy. And you're wondering why the blood of the Father is not going through your entire spiritual body. You're wondering why things aren't working the way they should be working. Maybe there might be parts of your body, maybe in your church body, maybe in your human body, that might be aches and pains. It might be a little numb. Whatever the case is going to be, it might be even changing color because the blood ain't pumping right. Whatever the case is, I am here to let you know right now that the heartbeat of Christian living begins and ends with how focused you are on the life giver, and that is Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here right now, and you don't know, you don't, you don't know Jesus. Contact us via the information given early in the show, www.get-prayer.com. Submit your prayer request. Subscribe to the podcast. We're on Spotify. There's no reason to miss us. We're everywhere we need to be. But I want you to think about it. The rhythm of receiving and giving, of internal growth and external action, creates this sustainable cycle of spiritual health. Like a strong heart, a vibrant faith requires both the systole of active service and the diastole of patient endurance. Together, these create the heartbeat of authentic Christian living, continuously circulating God's love through us and into the world. Because what you're doing creates a ripple, whether you believe it or not. I know you might think that being a janitor or being a trash man or digging ditches or maybe you're not the best person in the company or maybe whatever the case is maybe you're not playing on a, a pro team but a semi-pro team maybe your song didn't reach the top of itunes whatever the case is whatever you're doing out there do it for the lord do and, and let the world see your christian living through what you're doing just keep that in mind as you go about this week because i want you to be encouraged i want you to know that what's pumping through you physically, is also pumping through you, spiritually. May God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. And God willing, we'll talk to you next week. You take care.